Well, welcome Freedom Church this Sunday morning. It is great to see you this weekend. Can you believe that it is August? I cannot believe it's August. It's so good to be back with you. We have had a great series of undivided, talking about how we can be undivided as a church. And didn't our youth takeover go over so good last weekend? That was so great to see our youth worshiping, um, just to hear what they had to say about racial issues in our country, and really to see that we are in good hands, that they are not the church of the future, that they are the church of now, that they are a family that's serving together. And that was incredible to be able to enjoy that last weekend. It is August, though. We are here. We're starting a brand new series that we're going to be calling Relationship Goals. And it is great to be back with you. In fact, because of the amazing technologies that we have now, I will be preaching for you this weekend, Freedom Church, this first weekend in August. And I'm also right now preaching in Boise, Idaho to our friend, Pastor Cody Burbage and his wife, Brandy, who they've just moved Create Church into a permanent facility in Boise, Idaho. And Connie and I are there and with them. And we're so excited about being there with them. But we are mostly excited about being here with you this weekend, and uh, it's so good to have you joining us online. I know this is different. I know this isn't the way that we thought we would be doing church in August of 2020, back in March when we had to take a break for a while and coronavirus started to do its thing. I know we didn't expect this to be the way it was. I know this is not the way we would have written the story, but it is where we are, and we still can gather together and we still can hear God's word. And I want to encourage you, connect with your small group during the week. Connect with friends and ask them, what are you learning? What is God teaching you? Pray together. Share prayer requests together. And keep being the church. Freedom, you've been the church so far. Keep being the church as we continue to get closer and closer to God during this time. There's a lot of things that can be canceled and there's a lot of things that can change. But our relationship with God can strengthen during this time, Freedom Church, if you will allow God to continue to speak to you, to grow you, and to show you where he wants you to be. And I think one of the places where he can teach us that the most is in the area of relationships. And that's why we're starting this new series, Relationship Goals, because every single one of us should have goals when it comes to our relationships. Now, this series is inspired uh, by a pastor friend of mine who I've had the opportunity to meet on a couple of occasions, and maybe you've heard of Pastor Michael Todd before. He did a series of sermons in 2017 that really inspired all of us to think about our relationships. He's had a book come out in 2020 called Relationship Goals that also is based on that series. And that is certainly the inspiration for what we're going to be talking about. Now, we're not going to preach the book. You can read the book. Um, I'm not going to simply just uh, re-preach his series. You can go back and watch that series as well, and you can listen to that. And I'm also not just preaching to one group of people. So when you hear relationship goals, maybe you define relationships in a certain way, married people, or maybe for you it's single people, or maybe it's friends, or however you define relationships. We're going to cover all of those relationships over this series. And so let's get ready and hear about what God has to say about relationships, Freedom Church. Now, you may be asking, why a series on relationships. I mean, a whole series of sermons. Does God have that much to say about relationships? Well, I think we've been learning a lot about our need for relationships over the past several months together, haven't we? And I'll, I'll say this. Connie and I, over the last several weeks, as we went through a positive coronavirus uh, test together and tested positive for it and went through the symptoms and fought the virus at home from July 5th to July 23rd, 18 days where we were fighting and quarantined and all of those things that we had to be, that we were able to kind of learn a lot about relationships, a lot about the need for relationships. And what we see is that relationships are the glue that life's joys, pains, laughs, it holds our tears, everything together, it holds it 
together. We see that. The relationships are connected to us, and we are connected to relationships in so many ways. And we all have learned a lot about this need for relationships in the past few months, for sure. I mean, isolation has isolated our need, really. We've been able to see it, our need for meaningful relationships in our lives. And because relationships are a need in our lives, that means that unhealthy relationships, you ever had any of those? Right now in the chat, why don't you just give a little, you know, emoji, one of those smiley faces or an up, thumbs up, or if you haven't, you, you, you must be 12 years old and you just haven't had any relationships yet, you can put the thumbs down. But tell me about it. Have you had some relationships that have brought some pain into your life, unhealthy relationships? And those unhealthy, if, if there's a need in our life that we have for relationships, then unhealthy relationships or a lack of of relationships. I saw on our Facebook account recently that someone put one of their greatest needs that we could be praying for them was as a single mom developing relationships and friendships. And so there's a lack of relationships. When we have this need, this unhealthy relationship, these lack of relationships, or even damaged relationships, they, these things bring the most possible pain into our lives. If you'll trace back to the pain that you've had in your lives, if you'll kind of go mentally there and, and feel the emotion of it, you'll realize that most of the pain that you've ever had in your life came because of an unhealthy relationship, a lack of a relationship, or a damaged relationship. But unhealthy, or healthy relationships rather, and we all have had those, they can bring the most joy into our lives, can't they? I mean, when you have a healthy relationship, that is, you can trace back your pain, I know that, but you can also trace back joy in your life to healthy relationships. For my wife Connie and me, this was so evident over our 11 days of complete isolation from our kids and then some additional days of quarantine from the rest of the world and, and, and we were just in need of relationships, right? I mean, just being isolated from our kids alone was bringing, I mean, it was almost depressing at times. It was like I wanted to hug them and all we could do is talk to them on FaceTime. And our 14-year-old, our Isabel, was in charge of the whole house. She did such an incredible and amazing job. And the other kids did so wonderful. And, but I'm watching that, and I'm going to tell you, I don't care what your views are on the pandemic. I, I don't care what you think about masks, I, the virus, conspiracy theories, all of that. When it hits your home and you have to deal with the reality of it, it becomes real. And in those moments, it was rough. I'm going to tell you, you can have all the opinions in the world, but until you're watching your wife so sick and you literally can't do anything about it and you know that there's nothing that anyone else can do about it and you feel lonely and isolated and, and we felt horrible and Connie was in a lot of pain and having breathing issues related to her already existing asthma as well as all of the symptoms of a stomach bug that came one of the days. It was like the corona was throwing everything it could possibly throw at her at one time. And I'm watching that, and I felt horrible. If you've ever had the flu, I think there were a couple of days in a row that I slept 15 to 18 hours and just felt really bad, just felt horrible. But what God got us through, rather, were the relationships in our lives. Not to sound too elementary, but first and foremost, it was our relationship with God. I mean, just having this time where, where we're isolated and, and feeling lonely and sick and not, not feeling like you, you don't even know what's going to come around the next bend in every hour. And you just get this moment where you're like, I need God. I, I, need, I need time just to sit here and lay here and pray when that's all I can do is pray. I needed him to be able to feel peace when I was tempted to be anxious. Isn't that a temptation in all of our lives right now? 
just this temptation to feel anxious, to go, man, what is going to happen? When is this going to get better? When are we going to get some therapeutics for this? When are we going to know some answers about school? Like, what is happening? What do we do? What, how, do we, how do we make decisions as leaders? And I tell you, during that moment, when I was so tempted to feel anxious, what does the Bible tell us? Do not be anxious, but rather go to God in prayer. And so I would find, find just this time of prayer with God and just being with him and hearing from him and reading his word. I, I, would, I would find rest when I was tempted to be unsettled. I would just be so unsettled and so worried and feeling like I wanted to get anxious and didn't know what to do with my time. And, but I would feel this unbelievable peace and this unbelievable rest that would come from God. It was like the Bible calls it. It was a peace that passed all of our human understanding because there were some things to be anxious about. There were some things to be sad about. We couldn't see our kids. We're stuck in this room, and yet God was able to give me rest. I remember after probably the worst moment that we had, and in addition to everything that I mentioned before that was going on, it was like Connie's body decided to throw everything at her this one morning and try to get rid of the virus. It was breaking her down in order to break the virus down. And she started breaking out in these horrible hives just all over her body that were itching so bad. And she already felt bad. And it was just like adding one more thing. And I think this was probably the scariest moment in all of our sickness because it was just like everything was happening at once. But, but I remember that it was in that moment that, of course, I was praying and asking God to take you know, just this discomfort away from her to help the medicines to kick in that she had taken for the hives and just praying over her. And I felt like God spoke to me. And it was just in this moment I needed, I needed to hear from him. I don't know if you've ever been there in those moments where you're like, God, I don't have much more to say, but I need to hear from you. And I remember I heard from him, and it was, it was very simple. But I just felt like his presence was so tangible. Like I, I could feel it. I could reach out and touch him. And Connie actually took some Benadryl, which then knocked her out. And so she was finally getting some sleep and finally getting some rest. And I laid beside her, and I, I just had my hand on her, and I was praying for her. And I, like, I was out of words. I was just praying, God. Just continue to heal her. And I heard him say, it was, it was deep, and it was, it was yet so refreshing that I am the gift, he said. And I was like, yeah, I know, I know, God, you're a gift. And so would you heal Connie, and would you give me this, and would you give me her healing, and give me her healing. And he said, stop for just a moment. I am the gift. My presence is the gift. And it was this relationship with him. And it was in that moment that I realized what I needed most was him, his presence, a real relationship, actual time with him. Well, we're going to get into so much more in this sermon that I'm so excited about, but can I just encourage you with that? That it's in these moments when we're tempted to walk away from our relationship with God to stop joining in online. I know I'm speaking to the choir now because you're here and you're with us, but maybe you know some friends or maybe you've been tempted to do so or have done so a couple of times and just to stay connected, to hear God's word, to be reminded through worship. I know it's awkward to worship at home. I know, I know we haven't quite figured all that out yet. We, we don't know exactly what to do. It doesn't feel the same as it does when we hear. But can you just say, God, you're the gift? I want to connect with you. When your small group leader reaches out to you and says, what can I pray for you about? Would you be real with them? It's one of the things I worry about so much during this pandemic, during this lockdown of certain things where we can't meet in large groups. Is It's hard to know how to pastor you. It's hard to know if I am pastoring you. It's hard to know what to pray for for you. It's hard to gauge what's going on in your life. And so I oftentimes find that it's like when I was praying for Connie, I'm just 
Just like, God, would you just be with our church? Would you meet their needs? Would you help them to stay connected? Holy Spirit, would you draw them into yourself? Help them to stay connected to you, God. And it's in that moment that God reminds me again, he is the gift. His presence. He is the gift. Finding him in the moment every day. He is the gift. Going to his word and saying, God, would you teach me? Would you be with me? He is the gift. And so not just begging him for something or asking him for healing, which all of those things we can do, but just a what? A relationship. Relationship. And so God gave us the gift of a relationship with him, but God also gave us the gift of each other, of each other. I was thinking about this for Connie and I. I mean, we took care of each other. We lived out our vows for 11 days locked in a room together, for better or for worse, right? For sickness or for health. We lived them out. We said, I'll take care of you. I'll pray for you. I'll be here for you. I'll be, I'll be conversation with you. I, 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 will, I will be, when you're scared, I'll be the one who's not scared. I'll be, when you're anxious, I'll be praying so that you won't have to be. We were there for each other. But then there's another layer of that relationship. Because then it was our family. Was thinking about how we needed them. I mean, they fed us, our, our family fed us for the very first week along with just a couple of close friends because we didn't know how it was going to go. Was it going to get worse? Was it going to get better? We didn't know. And then our church jumped in for two more weeks after that and kept bringing food. And you guys were so amazing and it was so helpful. And people were checking in on us and calling and texting and sending cards. We got several cards every single day, like snail mail cards every single day. And it was so helpful to know <coughs> that we had people out there who loved us, who were taking care of us. Because here's the thing in this series, we want to be helpful, and in order to be helpful, we have to be truthful. And we've been in ministry for a long time, and we have been, Connie and I have been best friends for like 30 years now, and we've been best friends. And we have seen how much pain can come out of relationships. We can trace back some of the worst days of our lives to broken relationships, to people who hurt us. And so here's the truth. Our kids have seen incredible hurt. Our kids have walked through incredible pain, betrayal at the hands of relationships in our lives. And they've seen it. And they've lived it out, that pain. And so it was in this moment as people were showing up with food and people were sending texts to Izzy and checking in on her and our elders were checking in on us and our friends were checking in on us. People were praying for us that, that I realized it was in this season they got to experience firsthand the joy that relationships can bring as well. And so, so they've seen the pain and they got to see the joy that can come. And so we've seen this in our ministry and even in our own lives as well. The greatest joy and the greatest pain comes from our relationships. So many of my conversations uh, that, that I'll talk with Connie about that she has with women come from pain, from relationships. So, so many couples come into our offices and go through counseling, and it's the pain of relationships. Going into a new relationship, scarred by the pain of an old relationship. And so what happens is, as we hear these stories, and oftentimes it is because they're not following, people are not following the principles that God has given us in his word and through his Holy Spirit and then through wise counsel about relationships. And so that's what I want to set up today for the remaining time that we have together, is we're going to talk about the principles that God has in his word that will allow us to, to feel and enjoy the joy that can come from pain. Because relationship pain comes from ignorance and disobedience 
of God's Word and God's principles. Relationship, let's listen to that again. Relationship pain comes from ignorance and disobedience of God's principles. So when we disobey what we already know to be God's principles, or when we're not putting ourselves into a place where we can learn God's principles, that is when we have relationship pain in our lives. And so there are some principles. Let's look at Psalm 119, 1 through 4. Here's what the Bible has to say about the principles that God gives us. It says, you are blessed when you stay on course, walking steadily on the road revealed by God. There is a road, there is a way that is revealed by God, and we are blessed when we stay on it. You're blessed when you follow his directions, his principles, doing your best to find him. That's right. You don't go off on your own. You walk straight along the road he set. You, God, prescribe the right way to live, and now you expect us to live it. Oh, that my steps might be steady, keeping to the course that you set. And then I'd never have any regrets in comparing my life with your counsel. I thank you for speaking straight from your heart. I learned the pattern of your righteous ways. There's a pattern. There are principles about how we are to live our life. I'm going to do whatever you tell me to do. Don't ever walk off and leave me. Here's a truth that is hard to hear. We spend... Most of our lives ignoring God's principles. And then we are surprised when we don't experience God's purpose for our lives. Can I break that down just a little bit more? We spend most of our relationship lives ignoring or disobeying God's principles for relationships. We do it our own way, like the Scripture said. We go off on our own way, and another part of the Scripture says there is a way that seems right to man, and it always leads to death. And so we go off on our own way. We have our own ways of doing things. We don't follow God's ways for relationships, but then we're surprised when we don't experience God's purpose for our relationships. There are principles. Principles. Principle. Let's look at the word. The root word of this word principle is the word prince. You guys know what a prince is. He's the first in line to being the king, the prince. It means first. It it means the, the first of preeminence, the prince. So the principle then is a first foundational original law established by which a creation creature, rather, or created things is designed to function or be regulated. The principle is a foundational, highest on the totem pole, first foundational law about how things are to work. So it's the first law made by the manufacturer of something or someone. And when we think about relationships, marriage was not manufactured by the government or by man. It was manufactured, it was made by God. And so God has principles for our marriage. And so when we're wondering about our marriage, we should go to the first, the prince, the principles, the first foundations, God's foundations. Parenting. We didn't invent parenting. We didn't figure out how to do this thing called parenting on our own. God has principles for being a parent. How about business and finance? Oh, I mean, we just invented business and finance and (coughs) putting all those things together. We We just came up with all that in the economy. No, God invented it. And there are principles that he has. There are ways that God would have us run our businesses, run our departments, run our home finances. There are principles. And here's something to remember about all of these subjects. We all have thoughts on all of these things, right? All of you have marriage thoughts, the way that you think things should work. All of us have parenting advice that we would give, thoughts about what we have. All of us have thoughts on business and finance and how to run life. But 
anything that is not a principle is just an opinion. So really all you have is an opinion. And all of us have lots of opinions on everything. Have you noticed that lately? We all have opinions. Now, sometimes our opinions might be right if they line up with God's principles, but our opinions do not change God's principles. His principles need to shape our opinions. But many times, we're, we're trying to run our lives on opinions, and this causes so much pain. I mean, think about what most of you do. You have a marriage tension. What do you do? Go to your friend who may not even have a good marriage, who may not even be married, but you go to your friends and you say, hey, this is what my husband's doing, this is what my wife's doing. I mean, this is what's going on. I mean, what, what do you think? What do you think? Or, or even worse, maybe it's parenting too. Maybe you go to Facebook and like, Hey, what are your guys' opinions on? Fill in the parenting blank. Every time I see y'all doing that, I'm like, they have lost their mind. Why would you go and ask anybody for their opinions on that when you have somewhere you can go to avoid the pain and to get principles? To get principles. And, and here's the thing. The Satan, the enemy of your soul, who wants to destroy you, loves it when you operate your lives off of opinions. I mean, I just don't think there's anything wrong with living together before you're married. I just don't see anything wrong with that. And that's an old, antiquated thing, right? I mean, that's, that's my opinion. It's my opinion. Great. You have an opinion. As I've told you before, you don't have a universe. But when you get one, maybe you could have a principle like God has. And here's what God knows. He's not trying to be your cosmic killjoy. He's not trying to keep you from having fun in life. He's not trying to keep you from doing what would be best for you. He's trying to keep you from doing what would be worse for you. And what he knows is when you pretend to be married and you go into this relationship and you pretend that you're married sexually and you pretend that you're married financially and you pretend that you're married and you don't live by God's principles, that it can seem antiquated to you and it can seem like an opinion to you, but honestly, it's just ignorance of God's principles because he's trying to protect you. God's principles protect you. Because when you allow someone to pretend to be something that doesn't bring the same responsibility as really being something. And so someone can pretend to be your husband. And pretend husbands make really terrible husbands. Or someone can pretend to be your wife. But there's always an out. There's always a door. There's always a way that seems right to a man, and in the end, it leads to his death. And God knows that. And so he doesn't want us to be ignorant. He doesn't want us to not have awareness of the principles. Because principle means first, right? Listen to this. This, this is so good. Principle is first. Well, first in line. Check this out. Satan is called the prince of darkness in the Bible. That word for darkness in the Bible, that the Hebrew word there, that when it uses the prince of darkness, is the word koshik, koshik, which means literally in the Hebrew, ignorance. So Satan is the prince of ignorance. Satan takes advantage of the places where we are in the dark, ignorant of God's principles, where we are in the dark because we're living after our opinions, where we are in the dark, where we are ignorant because we refuse to hear what wise counsel and Holy Spirit has to say about our lives. He takes advantage of us walking in ignorance, in darkness, because he is the prince of ignorance. And he wants you to be ignorant of God's principles. He wants you to fumble and stumble around in the dark and not be able to find God's light. Our opinions are often Satan's ignorance on display in our lives rather than God's principles at work. Our opinions are oftentimes 
Satan's ability to keep us in the dark, Satan peddling his ignorance. Now, I mean, this is what, I mean, haven't you, how, aren't you enlightened now? I mean, don't you know that this is the way you're supposed to live your life? I mean, who, who, does, who does it God's way anymore? Ignorance peddled around and on display in our lives rather than God's principles at work in our lives, which is a couple who, when locked 11 days in a room together, leaned on each other, loved each other, took care of each other. In fact, I knew we were starting to get a little bit better when we had our first fight, right? Like we finally got aggravated with each other because into that moment we kicked in to God's principles, which is what he said. He said, I will give you a helper designed for you who fits perfectly with you and for you. She'll be everything that you'll need. And he'll be everything that you'll need. And together we were able to live out God's principles. God's principles at work. Relationships that are hard to work on, but we work on them. So Satan wants to keep us in the dark. But listen to this. But Jesus, he's the what? The light of the world. Look at what he said about himself. I am the world's light. No one follows me. No one who follows me stumbles around in the darkness, fumbles around in ignorance, fumbles around not knowing what to do. There are principles, and I provide plenty of light to live in, Jesus said. We would call him the prince of light, and the Hebrew word for knowledge actually means light. He is the prince of knowledge, and knowledge is light, and ignorance is darkness. So how do we get that light then in our lives, and what are some things that we can live by? Psalm 119 again. By your words, your knowledge, that light, I can see where I'm going. By your principles, I can see where I'm going. They throw a beam of light on my dark path. You have some places in your life where you feel like you're failing. You have some relationships in your life that aren't going so well. You need a beam of God's light, his knowledge, his principles onto those relationships. And then the Bible also tells us that Jesus is the word. Remember, it says, by your word, Jesus is the word. Come to life. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God and the Word was with God. So we get to follow a path lit by the Word of God and Jesus Himself and live our lives by His principles. He gives us the way to live through Jesus who's always existed. There's always been a way, a truth a life for how we live this life. And I know you may be joining us for the first time online. You may have been a part of this church forever. You may be going, I, I know that, that it's, it's cool right now to say, oh, you can figure it out on your own. Oh, you can, you can just, you got your own way, man. Just figure out your own way. But from the beginning, God has had principles. From the beginning, he's had a way that was the right way. And he has his hand reaching for us saying, would you follow my way? So we get to live and follow this path lit by the word of God and Jesus himself and live our lives by his principles which lead to abundant life instead of death. I, I know because I just know humans and I know what's going on with you. And I know during this time, unlike any, we feel more lost. We feel like we don't know what to do. We feel more anxious. And what I'm telling you is that God has a light for you to light your path. How? Matthew 6, listen to this. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything that you need. Here's the first principle for all relationships. First things first. 
God speaks principles into place, and it's always first, always. He only needs to speak it once, too. He doesn't have to repeat himself over and over again. He doesn't have to, for every new generation, make his truth known again. He's already made it known. Think about it, principle of gravity. He spoke it into existence, and gravity always works. It's always true. He doesn't have to get up every morning and go, oh, yeah, 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 I forgot. Things are floating around. Gravity, gravity. No, he doesn't have to speak it in again. It just works. The principle of time, it just always moves. It always rotates. It's always the principle of seasons. They just always happen, right? Because God spoke them into being one time. He doesn't have to do it. Over. And there are principles that you have to put into your life and that they have to li- you have to live your life by them and your life will begin to fall into place. First things first. And so that first thing is just to, to say, God, I will, put, I will use your principles. Really, it's the first among all equals of principles because if you will just put God's principles first, all other things, relationships, finances, all of these things will fall into place. So how do we do that? How do we do that? Well, I wrote down just a couple of things just to get us going. So here's what I want this sermon to do. I want this to send you on a journey. I want to send you on a journey reading the Bible for the next few months maybe even and going, God, what are your principles? What are your principles for my life? How do you teach me principles for relationships? We'll talk about a lot of those over the next part of this series. But let me just give you a few principles about relationships that come from God's Word, and that if we live them in our lives, just to get your mind thinking, just to get your mind thinking. And so, so over the past 30 years of following Jesus, walking through relationships over and over again, some who have brought pain, some who have brought joy, we found so much. And here's a couple of them. All relationships are spiritual. All relationships are spiritual. This kind of builds on the first things first principle. First, you've got to put the first into place. And all relationships, every relationship that you have is a spiritual part of your life. Every single relationship. And the principle that most people break most often is having some relationships that they don't consider to be spiritual relationships. And listen, the closer that you desire a person to be to you, the closer they need to be to God. Look at this. Look at this graph. So so you've got a concentric circle. And you can see right smack dab in the middle, first things first, your relationship, your life has to revolve around your closeness to God. So anyone who's going to be closest to you, a spouse, a a close friend, they've got to also be right here, closest to God. And then there are going to be some other relationships in your lives. You're going to to have some small group relationships. You're going to have some people that you go to every now and then. They're not your close friends that you work with. People that are just around you. Those people have to be in the, they need to be close to God if they're going to get that close to you. And then there's another circle. And these are going to be relationships that maybe at the ball field and relationships that are because they're in your family and you see them, but they're they're, they're further away from God. So the further away people are from God, the further away they have to be from you. Where finally there's this outside circle of people that are coming to, to, to know Jesus one day, but they're still far from God. Or maybe they're running from God and they're involved in all kinds of sin and all kinds of stuff. And you want to pray for them and you want to teach them about God and you want to see them come into a relationship with God. But the truth is, they can only be as close to you as they are close to God. And so here's a mistake that we make. We go two or three circles out to find our best friends. Well, I mean, I've always been best friends with this person. We grew up together. We went to school together. We we were there, but they don't love God. And all relationships are spiritual. And the closer that you grow to God, the further away they're going to be from you unless you can pray for them and pray them into a relationship with God. But if we try to make our best friends, those who don't love God, they will lead us into places and directions. And so so have you ever found yourself there? 
in a place where you're, you're, you're far away from God in a moment and you walk away from Him because you went to be with someone else who's far from God, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And those who are closest to us will allow us to get closer to God. How about this? You go outside of those to find a spouse. Talking about an important relationship, our relationship with a husband or a wife, and yet we will not look right within who's close to God. This is what I ask every person that I ever talk about who starts to date somebody. I say, do they love Jesus? Well, I mean, not, you know, a little bit. I mean, they go to church every now and then. I'm like, run, run. Like, if they don't love Jesus more than you, then Run. Like you need somebody who is going to help you walk with you with Jesus. Did they suggest that you live together? Are they the ones that brought you towards that? Are they suggesting that you, oh, let's just put off marriage. It's just, that's just a man-made thing. It doesn't really matter. Are they suggesting, well, hey, no, let's not join in on church this week. Let's just go do something different. I mean, you need somebody who's there with you and for you and wants to grow. Because all relationships are spiritual. And yet, we go outside of these circles and we try to find those to meet this need, this incredible need that we have in relationships. You want to know why your life is jacked up sometimes? Because you're relationships are jacked up. You, you want to know why you can't seem to have anything happen right in your life? Because you don't have the right people in your life. And so you've got people who don't love Jesus influencing you. You've got people who don't love Jesus giving you counsel. You've got people who don't love Jesus looking out for their best needs, not yours. And certainly not Matthew 6.33. They're not asking that you would be first and foremost meeting God's, the relationship of God and seeking after him so that all other things can fall into place. So all relationships are spiritual. None of them get a pass. So what does that mean then? You pray for your friends. You pray for them. Like, I mean, like, you pray that they would be in existence. You pray for your friends. You pray that they would find Jesus. You pray they would follow Jesus more. You, you pray them into your life. You pray for the trials that you go through with them. Because all relationships are spiritual. All of them are spiritual. And what I love about this principle is God promises that he will meet our needs and give us everything that we need when we put him first. And so if you'll put him first in that relationship, he'll meet your needs. Oh, I mean, if, if I don't just settle for a husband, I mean, I'm in my 30s, Pastor. I got to just find a husband at this point, just somebody who's willing to marry me. Can I just tell you, no husband is better than a sucky husband. And if you've got a sucky husband, you can raise your hand right now, put it in the chat and say, amen, Pastor. No wife better than a bad, nagging wife that doesn't love Jesus. And so it would be much better to pray yourself into a spiritual relationship and ask God to meet that need in your life. Said another way, every relationship has the ability to add light or darkness to your path. What will it be? Listen to that again. Every relationship has the ability to add light. Remember, Jesus is the prince of light, prince of knowledge, or darkness, ignorance, to your path. And you just got to ask yourself about your relationships, which one will it be? Second principle that we can look at, this is a principle that I believe we can live, is that relationships take work. Take work. M more than you think. A lot more than you think. It's rare to find organic friends. Uh -oh. Hey, how about this? It's, it's rare for Rachel just to stumble into a coffee shop on, in a wedding dress, running away from her red wedding, move in with her long-lost friend Monica, and become besties for life who cry together and share everything together and laugh together and share in life at the deepest level. And oh, by the way, your spouse just happens to live, future spouse just happens to live across the hallway from you and just all falls right into place. It's just amazing. But it doesn't happen that way except on a sitcom, because you don't stumble upon good friends and you don't stumble upon a good spouse. You work on them. 
just using our marriage for a moment. I, I truly believe that Connie and I have a great relationship that is worth modeling for each and every one of you. As your pastors, I believe you can look to us and learn from us. We love each other well. We make decisions together. We fight well. We fight for each other. Um, we parent together well. We're on the same page. And we generally have a great relationship. And we work really hard at it. Really hard. Honestly, a lot harder than most people would ever imagine and harder, quite frankly, than I've found that most people are willing to work. We work hard. We fight for date night. I budget for date night. We fight for the time for just the two of us every day. We fight for opportunities to talk and we talk about things when they're uncomfortable. We fight for it. We're honest with each other about our needs and when the other is not meeting our needs. We work hard. And I have the mic right now, so just let me just tell you too. Connie works hard on our marriage. Like she's working on it. She's reading about how to become a better wife. She's teaching our staff spouses how to become better wives. I mean, she's investing it in herself and in others. And I'm watching her. And I am a driven, creative leader with a ton of irons in the fire. And quite frankly, the, the great leadership I, uh, icon Peter Drucker called starting and pastoring a church like ours to be the second most stressful job in the world, up and only to the president of the United States. He said, now I don't know how you judge that. I don't know if he's right, but that's Peter Drucker. He's pretty smart. I can tell you it's a pretty stressful job dealing with you guys. And so I have that in my life. And I am, quite frankly, not always the easiest person to get along with. And I watch her work at it. I work at it. And I get to know her better, and she gets to know me better. And if Connie many years ago had decided, I mean, what will be will be. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I'm just not going to work at it very hard. If it was meant to be, it would just be easy, Right? I mean, if our marriage was supposed to be great, I mean, if we loved each other, amore, if we just loved each other, it'd be great, right? No, she said no. We wouldn't be who we are today if she hadn't said, no, I'm going to work at it. We're going to work on it. If we decided just to see what we stumbled upon, let me tell you what we stumbled upon. Two very selfish teenagers who started dating each other, who became two very selfish 20-something-year-olds. That's what we stumbled into. But we've worked at it. We wouldn't be who we are today. Friends, great marriages, new relationships, healthy and healed relationships will not just fall out of the sky. They take work. Here's another principle. Always give the benefit of the doubt. Some of the most pain in my own personal journey has been caused by people who did not give me the benefit of the doubt. Giving the benefit of the doubt is having the self-discipline to choose to believe the best about someone else and not invent facts and narratives about them. It's saying out loud, I, I doubt he would say that. I doubt he would ever do that. No, I doubt that she would mean it that way. I, I doubt that she had that intent. It's the benefit of the doubt, the doubt. The doubt really is belief in someone and that we clearly love them and that we clearly is what love and what God calls us to do. Look at 1 Corinthians 13, 7. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. Love shows the benefit of the doubt. And our world is often the opposite of this. We actually assume motives and write narratives about people, and then we spread them mercilessly. And the Bible says, no, I want you to have this principle where you have the benefit of the doubt about your relationships. You fight for relationships. Everything's spiritual. You pray for relationships. And the fourth thing is, last thing, you give grace lots and lots of grace. Now, now, this is different. This is not believing the best about someone. 
This is a whole other level of stuff right here. This is when someone actually does something to hurt you. It's not believing the best about them because they didn't do the best. They, they hurt you. Wait, you mean you don't write off anybody who hurts you? I mean, those are the people you don't want to be in relationship with, right? I mean, they hurt you. They disagree with you. They, they make a mistake. You just write them off, right? You just betray them, right? You just step away from them, right? No, no, no. You offer grace. Do you know how Connie and I have made it nearly 30 years as best friends, nearly 25 years in marriage? Lots and lots of grace. We give grace. Because we mess up and you mess up. And so you give grace in relationships. Why? Because John 15, 13 tells us this. Greater love has no one than this. To lay down one's life for one's friends. We've been offered so much grace by God. It is the only reasonable thing that we could do. To offer grace in our relationships. What if, what if we realize this, guys? That God has a way. He has a way, he has principles. And what if we saw that his way and living his way would mean that all of our relationships are spiritual? We need to relook at all of our friendships and go, have I made them spiritual? Are they close enough to God to be close enough to me? And what if we worked hard at our relationships? Determined to make them God-honoring. Determined to make decisions that follows God's way. And then what if we gave the benefit of the doubt when we don't know the motive and gave grace when we do? Do you think that this could change our relationships? Do you think that maybe we could set some new relationship goals? Do you think maybe there would be less pain, less darkness, less ignorance in our relationships if we found the light and said, Jesus, would you light my path towards healthy, vibrant relationships in my life? God, we're thankful that you are the prince of peace in our relationships, and you are the prince of and the, of light and the light of this world. And so, God, right now we pray that as we worship you and respond to you, that you would give us a new path, that you would speak to us in new areas of our relationships, that you would bring healing to hurt and pain and betrayal in our lives that has come out of darkness in relationships, and that, God, you would start to bring spiritual unbelievable relationships into our lives. God, thank you that you love us enough that we can have a relationship with you. Would you help us to strengthen even that today? And that will strengthen all of the relationships around us. In Jesus' name, amen.